So please take your Bibles. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Revelation. Wonderful, exciting study as we are going through the letters to the seven churches, the epistles that Jesus sent to the messengers of each of those churches. And from that, we learn what it is like to be under the blessing of our Lord and under the chastening of our Lord. We learn the character qualities of a church that he approves and the character quality of churches that he judges. Some of the churches still exist today. Others did not listen and have disappeared in the ash bin of history. It's a warning for not merely the church at large, but for this church in particular. Tonight we're looking at part two of church number four, the church at Thyatira. And that is in Revelation chapter two, beginning in verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because Thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, and as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already, and hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, To him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith, unto the churches. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, direct our study this evening that Jesus Christ, the Lord of the church and of the churches, will be glorified. For we see him here presented as a judge with flaming eyes, with feet of brass to crush the evil out of his church. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we might come before him with humility, with reverent fear, with moral purity, and with obedience. 
We pray that you will bless the going forth of your word tonight, that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Quick review. We're looking at the seven churches to which Jesus Christ sent letters via the Apostle John. The first church on the list was Ephesus, the second was Smyrna, the third was Pergamos. Smyrna, the second church, was the martyr church. The first and third churches, that is, Ephesus and Pergamos, had something in common. The Nicolaitans had tried to infiltrate both of those churches. They failed at Ephesus to infiltrate, but they had wild success at Pergamos. But in the end, the devil managed to kill both of those churches by different methods. Ephesus was slow, Pergamos was fast, but Smyrna still lives until this day, even though the devil murdered the believers by the bucket load at that church. We answered the question, why did the devil manage to wipe out Ephesus and Pergamos but fail to get Smyrna? And the short answer was, he used different methods. Two methods worked, the third method failed. The method that failed was at Smyrna. At Smyrna he used intense persecution. And as we see from church history, this is the least effective method in the devil's toolbox against genuine Christians. Intense persecution has a lot of positive effects on true believers, and I, I gave you, you will recall, a, a list of six positive effects of persecution. And that's why the church always grows during times of suffering and persecution. We see it very consistently throughout church history and in the world today. The old saying is true, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. We then answered the question, so if that's true, why does the devil still use intense persecution? And Jesus gave the short answer in John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. In other words, the short answer is the devil loves to kill God's people. Even though he knows it won't stop them, he's a murderer from the beginning, and he revels in human blood. Even though Cain killed Abel, Jesus says that Satan was the real murderer. Satan is the one who personally motivated Cain to kill his brother. Cain's offering to God was rejected because it was disobedience in the details. And we've talked about how God expects precise obedience in the details. Cain is mentioned in two other places in the New Testament that explain the devil's lust to murder believers. In 1 John 3:12. John writes, not his Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's works were righteous. That verse explains why it's easy for the devil to radicalize religious and secular unbelievers to murder Christians. Because light cannot tolerate darkness. Unbelievers, whether religious or secular, do have a conscience. Romans 2 is quite clear that all men are guilty because God has given them a conscience to know right from wrong, to know good from evil. But men don't like the thought that they are bad. They always want to think that they're good, and they want other people to think that they are good according to their own standards, but not according to the external standards set by God. When you tell such a person that he's a sinner, he gets furious. John 3.19 says the same thing, and this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, because, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Jesus put it this way in the Gospel of John in chapter 8.12, 8, 12 and 12.35. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. That's the contrast that God gives. The world is in darkness. They follow the prince of darkness. They murder those who walk in the light. At Jesus' arrest, Jesus made that principle clear again in chapter 22 of Luke, verse 53. When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hand against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Evil people 
who are motivated by the devil can never tolerate a righteous person who tells them that there is a different opinion called truth. When true goodness is set alongside their dirty souls, it proves that they are not good and they go berserk. They have to get rid of the light that exposes their sin. That's why Smyrna was a martyr church. They didn't have all the doctrinal background that Ephesus had, but they lived. They were persecuted and murdered, but the church lived. Over 300,000 people in Smyrna today that call themselves Christians. Jesus was perfect, but the Sanhedrin had to get rid of him because he was making them look bad, and they wanted everybody to think that they were good, the pious hypocrites. They were murderers like their father the devil, but they wanted to pretend to look good so that they could get the praise of men. The other verse in the New Testament that mentions Cain and has a bearing on our text in Revelation is Jude one eleven. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Now the reason that that verse about Cain is so important because it mentions both Cain and Balaam, whom we have already studied, the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam, the compromising, greedy prophet, whom we studied in detail in our examination of how the doctrine and practice of Balaam mirrored the doctrine and practice of the Nicolaitans, both at Ephesus and at Pergamos. We saw that the way of Cain involved at least three elements. Defective obedience. He did bring a sacrifice, but not the one God called for. He was self-willed, and therefore it was inadequate worship. He determined what he wanted to bring, not what God required. And murder. Cain was the first murder in the history of man. And the secret murder related to defective worship and versus obedient worship. So we tried to put it all together as we finished Pergamos to move into Thyatira. Merely using the blunt tool of murder has never stopped and will never stop the spread of true Christianity. The two churches that fell had problems with Nicolaitans, but nobody goes by the name Nicolaitan today. However, many churches today are Nicolaitan in nature. We want to talk a little bit about that tonight. We concluded that Nicolaitanism can be divided into two halves. Number one, evil doctrine. Number two, immoral practices. And that is why the church at Thyatira follows Pergamos, because immoral practice was flooding the church at Thyatira. Different approaches to dealing with Nicolaitans is the key to why one church fell quickly and one fell slowly. In other words, Pergamos fell quickly, Ephesus fell slowly, but they both fell. Ephesus handled the Nicolaitans one way, which was strict rejection. Pergamos compromised with them in an attempt to remain relevant and, quote, connected to their culture, which, of course, was much to the damage of that church. So in between Ephesus and Pergamos, Christ sent his message to Smyrna, the church that refused to compromise either in doctrine or practice and suffered terribly as a result. But that's the church that's alive today. Ephesus hated the Nicolaitans, but that was not enough. We saw that already. Being negative is never enough. Pergamos fell quickly. Ephesus fell slowly. Remember the maxim that I gave to you. Sound doctrine will always slow apostasy down and delay the death of a church, but it will not stop it. You have to have more than sound doctrine. And Jesus told Ephesus what it was they were missing. They had sound doctrine. It slowed down the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the practice of the Nicolaitans, but it was not enough. They had lost their first love. You have to have sound doctrine, and you have to have that intense first love for Christ. We learned something from the other two churches, too, from Pergamos and Thyatira. There's one other thing. You have to have sound doctrine. You have to have love for Christ. And you have to have moral purity. Moral purity. You see, Pergamos and Thyatira have some very good things said about them. Jesus himself says good things about those two churches. But what they lacked was moral purity. As long as sound doctrine's in place, it'll slow down the infiltration and decay brought on by the heirs of the Nicolaitans. The second obvious observation, which I just mentioned, was love for Christ is the most important personal qualification for the continued life of the church. 
The third observation was ecumenical participation will water down sound doctrine and enhance false loves. We saw that Council of Ephesus in 431 is where the worship of Mary was introduced. It was introduced at Ephesus. That was the perfect introduction for Church 4 Thyatira. The devil finally got the church at Ephesus after a long period of seduction and absorbing the culture through divisions in leadership and an ecumenical council. Without agape love for Christ, sound doctrine eventually erodes into pagan sex orgies and erotic sexual love for pagan gods, and that's how the devil got Ephesus by pulling them into the worship of Mary, which of course continues to this day in Roman Catholicism. That set the stage for Thyatira, where we find Jezebel in charge. God never ordained spiritual female leadership in the church, like the worship of Mary at Ephesus, and God never ordained physical female leadership in the church, which was what was the problem with the sex cult at Thyatira. So in a nutshell, nothing has changed today. The issue is still the same, but now it's called Christian liberty, but with a twist that permits immorality. At Pergamos, Satan crushed the church with what the church leadership thought would make the church thrive and grow. They assimilated their culture and had a loose view of so-called Christian liberty. But it wasn't true Christian liberty. It was only a counterfeit. I'm going to say this again. You've heard me say it probably a hundred times, maybe more than that, since I've been here at this church. Christian liberty, and I hope you get this, Christian liberty is not the right to do what you want to do. True Christian liberty is the power to do what you ought to do. It's not a right and a want. It's a power and an ought. What you want to do is a manifestation of the sinful flesh, letting the old sin nature take control of your thoughts, words, deeds, attitudes, and motives. A loose view of Christian liberty will always end in doctrinal compromise. It will always end in the lowering of moral standards. It will always end in a hazy sense of fitting in with your culture. And ultimately, it will end with judgment by God and the death of the church. That's where the church growth movement in modern church, churchianity finds itself today. Always beware when somebody tells you, that to reach our world, we have to make the church relevant to the culture if we want it to grow. That's dangerous language. God did not tell us to make the church relevant according to the standards of the world. That's very important. He did not tell us to make the church relevant according to the standards of the world. He told us to call sinners to repentance. That is what truly is relevant in a sin-saturated society. We have liberty in Christ, but it's a liberty that relates to holiness, not to immorality. The modern church leaders who are spewing loose views of Christian liberty are the spiritual heir of the Nicolaitans and of Jezebel at Thyatira. Pergamos was where the devil lived. They had Satan's seat there. The entire area was obviously a hotbed of demonic activity. So that gives us a connection between Pergamos and Thyatira. Jesus reminded Pergamos that the final authority is the word of God, not their feel-good theology that ended in grotesque sex sins. Well, Pergamos and Thyatira had a few good things going for their churches, but they had obviously not taken a stand on moral issues or separation from worldliness. As a result, Fornication was rampant in both churches, which held to a perverted form of so-called Christian liberty. It's really interesting when we move into Thyatira, both fornication and adultery are mentioned. They're not the same thing. Fornication is much broader than adultery. Adultery is being in a marriage bond that's a legitimate bond and stepping outside of that bond while that bond is still in place. But fornication includes every form of sin outside of God-ordained marriage between one man and one woman till death them do part. And I'm sure you know there are a lot of very gross sex sins that perverts have invented. 
But these things are not okay with God, even if some so-called evangelicals are promoting, for example, gay marriages, or living together, or I call them serial marriages, what most of the world calls divorce and remarriage, which is merely legalized adultery. The final authority in scripture is not what makes you feel good. It's the Bible. Remember that when you start talking about so-called Christian liberty is really an exercise in carnality. It's the Bible that's the final authority. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents. What's the reason you're doing this? The thoughts and intents of the heart. God looks at the reason behind what you're doing, even if it looks good and pious on the outside. You see, the Bible reveals our real motives, especially if they're designed to stimulate the flesh. Verse 13 there in Hebrews chapter 4 says that we are naked when God looks into the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You can't fool God. Clothing and makeup can hide your ugly fat and your ugly face, but if you have nothing on, everybody would see what you're really like. God sees you naked all the time. The Christians at Pergamos were truly saved, but they were clearly carnal Christians. Verse 13 proves their salvation. It says, I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days when Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Now, Pergamos had four words of praise that Jesus himself gave to them, but the devil still got them. The four words of praise that Jesus gave, works that proved salvation. Number two, clinging to the name of Christ through thick and thin. Number three, never denying the faith of Christ. Number four, martyrdom. How much more committed to Christ can you be than that? But he still judged them. Did you know that Thyatira, that we're looking at tonight, had even more words of praise? In fact, whereas Pergamos had four words of praise, Thyatira had ten words of praise from Jesus. (laughs) But they also had Jezebel, and they did nothing about it. You see, God doesn't just expect you to have lots of words of praise. Yeah, you've got all these good things going, so we'll overlook that one little problem that you've got. God expects you to deal with the sin that's in the church, even if it isn't politically correct and even if it's not popular. Listen to the ten things that Jesus commended them about. Number one, the same thing that he commended Pergamos for. Works that proved salvation. Number two, the thing that Ephesus missed. He says, and your charity, that's agape love. That's the thing that Ephesus didn't have. And Thyatira had it. Number three, Service. They had humility. They were willing to serve others. Not a bunch of arrogant know it alls. These were humble Christian people. They worked hard for Jesus. Number four, the thing that we in the Reformation tradition. <laughs> think is key and central to everything. Jesus says you have faith. That's the heart of the Reformation, justification by faith. Faith is the key. They had it. They understood what it meant to trust in Christ for salvation and for life. The fifth thing that they had, Jesus Gives them a word of praise for this. They had patience. Now, I hope you remember 
the distinction that I have taught you between patience and long-suffering. Patience is handling graciously the difficult circumstances of life. Long-suffering is handling the difficult people of life. Patience deals with circumstances. Long-suffering, macrothumia, deals with difficult people. Jesus says, I know you're going through hard times, but you're willing to deal with those hard times graciously for Christ. Now look at number six. In fact, this is an amazing thing. He's going to mention this three times in his epistle to Thyatira. We have a double mention of their works there. And thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Here's the second time he talks about the incredible works at Thyatira. They really knocked themselves out for Christ. And that second time he mentions it, he says, the last to be more than the first. You started out well. You are really working for me. And wow, I can, I can hardly believe it. Now you're even working harder than you did before. Your work's more than the first. Number seven. They had people in the church who did not buy into Jezebel's doctrine. They had people in that church who had not gone along with Jezebel. But Jezebel was still there. And the church corporate had not dealt with Jezebel. Number eight, they had people in the church that had not known the depths of Satan. Jesus is saying that what Jezebel was teaching was the doctrine of devils. It was the deep doctrine of Satan, the place where he undermines the foundations of the church, where you go down and go beneath the foundation, and everything up on top looks so good, and he's been commending them for all the stuff up on top, the superstructure. But the depths of Satan, there were termites that were getting down into the foundation. They were undermining the foundation, and at some point that entire structure was going to come down. But there are some that have not known the depths of Satan. Number nine, at Thyatira there were people in the church who were holding fast. They're never going to let go. They love Jesus with all their hearts. They're going to serve Jesus with all their hearts. No matter what's happening around them, they will move forward for Christ. They will keep their eyes fixed on eternity. They will do the will of God. But they're in that church. They were hanging on for dear life. They were never going to let go. And number 10, and this is amazing because this is the third mention of works in verse 26. There were people in that church who were doing God's work to the very end. You know, as you read that, you get a very strong sense that Thyatira was an active church. Three times their works are mentioned and praised. But now listen. Doing good works for Christ is not enough without moral purity. Just like having sound doctrine at Ephesus was not enough if you don't have your first love for Christ. Having the good stuff does not mean that God is going to overlook the bad stuff. The primary sin at Pergamos appeared to be the temporal world. In other words, what we know as worldliness. In contrast, the primary sin at Thyatira appears to be cultural accommodation and compromise. Pergamos ignored the sharp two-edged sword on the issue of worldliness. Thyatira perverted the doctrine of Christian liberty. The New Testament has a lot to say on those subjects, and I read many of those passages to you last week, 
John 15, 18, where we're, we were talking about worldliness, you know the world hates you. Uh, if you. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Pergamos didn't want the world to hate them. And so they yielded to worldliness. Paul speaks of it in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Could well I have written both to Pergamos and Thyatira, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. James 1.27 Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And we find it tied to the immorality that we see in Thyatira over in James chapter 4, verse 4. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is, not might be, is the enemy of God. John, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now he's got a little bit of the love of the Father and a little bit of the love of the world. It says, if you love the world... The love of the Father is not in you. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, that's Pergamos and Thyatira. The lust of the eyes, Pergamos and Thyatira. The pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, Revelation chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, gives us the transition from Pergamos to Thyatira because it connects the fornication plot of Balaam and things sacrificed to idols, both of which are mentioned at the church in Thyatira. We see both those things in Pergamos, and we see them re-emphasized and restated in Thyatira. Verse 14, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to th eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Both things are tied together. Now last week in our discussion about things offered unto idols, and we started that discussion, and one of the key accusations that Jesus made against Thyatira and Jezebel was this business about things offered unto idols. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, this verse 20, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, when I was at a so-called Christian college, I frequently ran into students who held to all the same positions that we've looked at at Pergamos and at Thyatira. They were students who held to the doctrine and deeds of the Nicolaitans. That was number one. There were students who held the position that, quote, God is a God of love and not a God of judgment. That's another crowd. Third crowd that I ran into, the who cares about the weaker brother crowd? This is our liberty. The fourth group that really believed, quote, and I can't believe that, but there are young men and young women that told me this, a little sex never hurt anybody. That, folks, was not at the University of California in Berkeley. That was at Gordon College in Wenham, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. 
which at that time was known as the Wheaton of the East Coast, and Westmont College was known as the Wheaton of the West Coast. And I'd get into these discussions with these young people, and they would think that I was absolutely nuts because I said, God calls us to absolute moral purity. And they say, come on, Spencer. A little sex never hurt anybody. Hmm, yeah, that was a dumb, stupid statement. You can get an STD just for one thing, after one encounter. And then the fifth group, and this was really the majority, the fifth group that thought that there was nothing wrong with focusing on temporal stuff. <laughs> oh, friends, all five of those positions are positions held by the Nicolaitans, the church at Pergamos, and the church at Thyatira. In every case, these are antinomians. Those are people who, if you cross them at any point, piously pointed the finger at you and snorted, you legalist. Oh man, I've had so many people call me, you legalist, over the years. Starting in high school, went away to a Christian boys school. And how many times I got called a legalist. Antinomians, who thoughtful Christians should beware of, especially Christians who are trying to hold the line on moral purity and separation. The American church today, even in evangelical circles, is primarily antinomian. That is against the law. That is, they are opposed to any absolute standards. They want what they call flexible standards. If you hold to absolute standards, they'll call you a legalist. Do you understand that's what's going on in the transgender movement? They want a flexible standard. So if you feel like you're a male, even if you're biologically a female, you can, you can be a male. Or if you're biologically a male and you feel like a female, it's a flexible standard. You can be a female. Do you understand that that goes back to Thyatira? and Pergamos, and Nicolaitans. And that has permeated the church today. I hope you read that little article that I put in your bulletins this morning about the so-called transgender movement. These are people who are sinners. They're lost. They need to be told that Christ died for their sins. He died for every kind of sin that there is. No sins are excluded. But we don't adapt to the culture. Instead, we lovingly call them to repentance because that is sin and that's what the Bible says but you know something if you take those stands they will hate you and they will do everything they can to destroy you because they want to call that good and they do not want the external standards that God himself has given If somebody calls you a legalist, it normally shows they have no concept of the biblical definition of legalism. Now, I've taught you in detail about that before, but biblically, legalism falls into two categories, and each of the two categories have two subheadings. First, apostate legalism. That's the teaching that you have to keep some law to obtain salvation. There's apostate Jewish legalism, that's the first category under this which teaches that you have to keep the law of Moses to get saved. Then there's apostate pagan legalism, which teaches you must keep some law of man to be saved. So that's apostasy. Apostasy deals with salvation. Jewish, keep the law of Moses to be saved. Pagan, keep some pagan rules to get saved. Then the second major division is heretical legalism. That deals with sanctification. Apostasy deals with salvation. Heresy deals with sanctification. Heretical legalism teaches that you have to keep some law to be sanctified. And so, of course, they're the same two subcategories. There is heretical Jewish legalism, which teaches you must keep the law of Moses for sanctification. That is, to become sanctified. And there is heretical pagan legalism, which teaches you must keep some law of man to be sanctified. 
So when somebody calls you a legalist, say, now, wait a minute, let's define terms. Which category am I falling in? Am I teaching that you have to keep some law, whether Jewish law or pagan law, to be saved? Am I teaching that? Well, if you push them hard enough, they'll finally say, well, no, you're not. So you say, okay, at least I'm not an apostate legalist, right? Okay. So is it, then, then am I teaching that you have to keep some law of Moses or of the Bible to become sanctified? Or am I teaching that you have to keep some law of man to become sanctified? And if you push them hard enough, they'll finally have to admit, well, no, I guess you're not teaching that. Say, so, so then why are you calling me a, legalism, a legalist? Just because I'm teaching something that you don't like? Why are you throwing that term at me? That's not biblically what the Bible calls legalism. There are multiple ways carnal Christians try to get around the clear division of biblical legalism. There are usually four categories of carnal arguments used by Christians who want to excuse their own sins. Let me give you these four categories of carnal arguments so that you'll know how to answer the arguments. It will also help you understand the first four churches in Revelation if you understand these categories of carnal arguments used by Christians who want to excuse their own sins. It will help you understand the churches in Revelation. So instead of being negative, because they always talk about legalists are negative, <laughs> let me state the positive side of the four principles that answer the false premises of carnal Christians. Number one, here's the positive statement of what we stand for. Believing that God has clearly defined moral standards by which he commands his people to live is not legalism. Let me say it again. Believing that God has clearly defined moral standards by which he commands his people to live is not legalism. Number two, applying those standards to modern society and modern activities is not legalism. You know, God didn't write anything in the Bible anywhere that mentions internet pornography. He doesn't say that at some time future in the history of the world, there will come this amazing device whereby you can go on something that is called the internet, and through that you can access these websites that show naked men and women. Don't look at them. I remember back in college, one of my roommates, actually tried to argue with me that since the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not smoke cigarettes, therefore it's sm smoking cigarettes is okay. <laughs> I, I said to him, so-and-so, does the Bible say that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Well, after we went back and forth on that a while, he said, finally, well, yeah, I guess he does. So I said to him, does the Bible say that anybody who defiles the temple of the Holy Spirit, him will God destroy? back and forth, back and forth. Well, fine, yeah, I guess that's so. I said, so-and-so, and this was way back in the 60s, and we've got a lot more evidence today. I said to him, so-and-so, does smoking cigarettes defile your body and produce certain kinds of lung cancers? And we know now that it produces a whole lot more things than that. Well, he really didn't want to admit that because, you see, it undermined his premise that if the Bible doesn't list the sin specifically, that therefore it's not sin. But the Bible gives you standards by which to live, and they are absolute standards, and they are moral standards because they affect what you want to do with your sin nature. And so applying... The standards that God has given to modern society and to modern activities is not, therefore, legalism. Number three, 
applying biblical principles, not merely biblical commands and prohibitions, is not legalism. And of course, that would certainly fit the example that I just gave you. There's no Bible verse that says, thou shalt not smoke cigarettes. But there are multiple verses that teach the body of the believer is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that defiling the temple of the Holy Spirit will lead to the death of the believer who does it. So Bible principles take over when there's no Bible command or prohibition on a specific subject. There's no Bible prohibition that says, thou shalt not drive 70 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour school zone. But there are Bible principles that tell you to obey the higher authorities whom God has ordained, for they bear not the sword in vain. Romans chapter 13. Number four, when somebody tries to force you to be a legalist, you see, if these principles had been applied at Pergamos and at Thyatira, it would have resolved the issues at those two churches. Number four, claiming that sinful acts, as defined in the Bible, are permissible because we're under grace. Oh, I have heard this so many times. Spencer, you're a legalist. Don't you understand we're under grace, we're not under law? Of course I understand we're under grace, not under, not under law. But that, to try to use that as an excuse for sin, is an abuse of the doctrine of grace. Grace is not God permitting you to keep on doing evil things. Paul makes a point of that in Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid! How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? In other words, the grace of God enables you to overcome the sin. It's not the permission slip to go on continuing in sin. That's a redefinition of grace. And Paul makes that clear in Romans 6. How about Romans chapter 3, verses 5 through 8? But if our unrighteousness, and here people, Paul says there are people arguing this back in the days of the apostles. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? In other words, huh, you know, when we're bad, that shows how good God is. It's not fair for God to take judgment on me because I'm showing how good he is by being bad. It's like I was driving down the road one day, this was years and years ago, and there was this motorcycle guy in this black metal helmet and, you know, nothing on but a leather short sleeve jacket. And on the back of his jacket, it said, I'm the kind of guy that your mother warned you to watch out for. <laughs> Folks, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And Paul says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who takes vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? You can't claim that just because you're so bad makes God look so good. Because otherwise, God would in the end have to say, well, you guys are so bad, you all make me look good, I guess I can't judge you. For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why am I yet also judged as a sinner? He has given him glory. Verse 8, here's the key verse. And not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come. That's what was going on at Thyatira. That's the doctrine of Jezebel. Let us do evil that good may come. It's okay if you're committing fornication. It's okay if you're committing adultery. It's okay if you're going to the temple where they're selling that meat and, all, and eating food that was offered to the idols. It's okay because 
Et Paul! She's falsely accusing Paul, and I think that she'd read Paul. As we slanderously report, be reported, and as some affirm that we say, this is not what I said, says Paul. Let us do all the good may come. And he says, you know the people that are slandering me on that? The people who are teaching that as true doctrine? The people who are claiming that they're quoting me about that? He says, whose damnation is just. Let them fry. The Apostle Paul has some specific instructions on that issue, and some had tried to set Paul in opposition to John. And of course, Romans chapter 2, verse 22, Paul mentions both issues that were problems at Thyatira, both idolatry and adultery. Romans 2, 22. Thou sayest that a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? You begin to sense right away that the people at Thyatira had heard what Paul had taught, but Jezebel had taken it and twisted it by referring them to Paul's discussion of Christian liberty in Galatians, but leaving parts out and misquoting other parts. Because those are two same issues that Paul writes to Rome about, and Paul writes to the churches of Galatia. On that issue of, in 1 Corinthians 8, where he's an extended discussion on whether or not a Christian should eat things that have been offered in sacrifice to idols, he does it in the context of Christian liberty. We studied that passage last week. That's for those of you who weren't here, go ahead and jot down 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 13. And I'll just read you the last two verses last three verses through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died but when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience ye sin against Christ wherefore if meat make my brother to offend I will eat no flesh while the world standeth lest I make my brother to offend we discussed in detail the idea of weaker brothers last Sunday and how important it is to make sure that we don't make weaker brothers fall. But I want to say something about the so-called weaker brother. The weaker brother is the one who is tempted to sin. He's tempted to sin when you do something that violates his conscience. And an issue came up after the service last week and I, I need to clarify something here. The weaker brother is not the same as the obnoxious brother. There is a difference between the weaker brother and the obnoxious brother who screams and yells at you about his conscience and his rights. He is not the weaker brother. You will never tempt him to sin by what you are doing. He is not weaker. He's merely obnoxious. One of our men stopped by after church when I preached that first message on Thyatira. He said that since certain men in the presbytery claimed to be weaker brothers, whose conscience would be offended if the presbytery incorporated, that he had stopped pushing the issue of incorporation. But those men think nothing about offending the conscience of the rest of the presbytery. To them, their own, their conscience is the only conscience that counts based on irrational fear of the government and opposition to the government. Frankly, when they do that, that pulls back a thin veneer of rebellion to God-ordained authority and the weaker brother argument is only an excuse to act pious. Their claimed conscience has nothing to do with the weaker brother issues in 1 Corinthians or in Revelation. You see, those passages where we're talking about the weaker brother deal with moral purity, idolatry, and acts of worship. That's the context of the weaker brother. That's the context of Paul's weaker brother discussions. 
And their arguments about incorporation have nothing to do with weaker brother. They're merely being obnoxious brothers. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and our time is up. But in chapter 9, Paul talks about his right to marry. He talks about his right to get paid and why the church should pay its pastor. He talks about how to witness to Jews and Gentiles. And finally, he concludes chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians with how to earn heavenly rewards. In chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, he discusses Israel's ten acts of rebellion in the wilderness and also discusses again why to pay the pastor. He talks about sacrifices to idols. In other words, he jumps from chapter 8 back to the same topic as you get to the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He talks about sacrifices to idols in chapter 10 in the context of the Lord's table. Ah, that's why I said we see it in relation to moral purity. We see it, the weaker brother thing, in relation to idolatry. And we see it in relation to worship. Weaker brother doesn't even fall into that category of should we incorporate or not. That has nothing to do with it. There's not a principle that's established. The weaker brother is not the obnoxious brother. The weaker brother is the one who is tempted to sin when he sees you doing something in the issue of moral purity that you ought not to do, in the issue of idolatry that you ought not to do, in the issue of worship that you ought not to do. Those are the three categories where the weaker brother comes in as lined out in our text. But we don't have time to go into that tonight. But let me just say one thing. I suspect that the Jezebel at Thyatira had been exposed to the teaching of Paul on Christian liberty. She'd been exposed to the teaching of Paul on sex and things offered to idols, but she perverted it for her own end, just like modern cultists and charismatics twist the scripture today. We know that the apostates were twisting the writings of Paul leaving the days of the apostles because Peter said so in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through 18. An account of the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Paul, Peter is acknowledging that the writings of Paul are inspired. As also in all his epistles, oh, not just in one or two, as in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Now, as Peter says, yeah, I know Paul's got tough doctrine. It's really hard to understand some of the things that Paul is saying. But he says, which they that are unlearned and unstable. That takes you to Pergamos and Thyatira. Rest, that means twist. As they do also the other scriptures. Peter just called Paul's writings, all of Paul's writings, scripture. Peter, the apostle of our Lord, who sat under his ministry on earth for three years, who knew that Jesus called the Old Testament inspired, not a jot or a tittle would be broken, who understood the position of Jesus on the Old Testament, and he calls the writings of Paul scripture. And he says, the wicked are twisting those things as they do the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Did you know this was a key issue? At the first Jerusalem council in Acts chapter 15, the two things that we see at Pergamos and Thyatira where the council determined that Gentiles didn't have to be sacrificed, but they said, you know, tell them the things they've got to watch out for are fornication and things sacrificed to idols. That goes all the way back to Acts 15. And we get to Pergamos and Thyatira and we find the same two issues were still plaguing the church, and the same two issues apply today. 2 Corinthians 6 is another passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 is another passage.
And did you know Thessalonians has the exact same, we don't have time to look at it tonight, but Thessalonians receives the exact same recommendations, praise, and commendations that were given to the church at Thyatira, but Jesus does not accuse the church at Thessalonica of the same evil deeds that he accused Thyatira of. It's fascinating to compare the different churches of the New Testament so that we can understand what Jesus gives praise to and what Jesus condemns. Our time is up. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. You are truly an incredible, marvelous God, but you're a God of holiness, not a wishy-washy God of circumstances, and so we'll let boys be boys and let things slide because they do have a few good things about them. You're a God who has given us your word. You're a God who has given us your spirit so that we are empowered. And therefore, you are a God who expects absolute obedience because we have no excuse. You've told us what is right, and you've empowered us to do it. There is no excuse if we don't. We can't say, well, but God, you accept no ifs, ands, and buts. We can't say, if only we just compromised a little bit and just sort of blended in with our culture, more people would come to church. Or if we just sort of overlooked the sins of some Christians, then other Christians would feel comfortable and not feel judgmental. Or if we only didn't appear to be legalists, help us to remember Pergamos. Four marvelous words of praise at Pergamos. Help us to remember Thyatira. Ten words of praise from Jesus himself at Thyatira. But both churches. We're filled with compromised worldliness and gross immorality. They had failed to uphold your standards of holiness. Our gracious Father, teach us so that we might learn and that we might obey. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this evening. I can find my little card, is number two, Holy God, we praise thy name. Well appropriate for remembering the holiness of God as we compare it with Thyatira. Number two, Holy God.